have a little bit of our idea of how lake ecosystems work, let's talk about how humans screw things up. So we're going to talk about how humans are impacting lakes. Now, um, the first thing I want to talk about is what about the watershed? Okay, the watershed is an area that drains the, the entire area of land that the water drains into a lake. So when we talk about the watershed of Lake Superior, it's actually relatively small, right? It's just this area, you know, around the lake, whereas, you know, it, so if a drop of rain lands here, it's eventually going to run into Lake Superior, whereas if a drop of rain, you know, lands here, it's going to eventually flow down the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico. But um, what we see is that a water body is a product of its watershed. So anything that you do here impacts Lake Superior. So um, if you have agriculture, if you have mining here, if you have a city here, so Duluth is like right here, right? Anything you do in Duluth impacts Lake Superior. So um, the, the water body is a product of its watershed. That's, that, that's kind of how I want to put that. So it's, but not every like impact is equal. The closer you are to the lake, the so if you add you know a fertilizer to um, to ground that's a hundred miles away from a lake versus right you know like right next to it, if you add fertilizer here, the fertilizer that you added here is going to have a bigger impact on that lake. And what we see is that also depending on on the shoreline. So if the shoreline is it's in its natural state, so if there's a wetland or a forest or a prey there, it's going to act as a natural filter. Whereas if you have human modified landscape that is right next to, right on the lake, that's going to have, um, like, like without that natural buffer, it's going to have a bigger impact. So what we've seen is with, um, kind of with lakes, there's this threshold between, um, as you start to, you know, get a nice pristine lake and people are like, hey, let's build a cabin on this lake. If they, you know, in the lake, so, you know, let's say the lake is a big round lake like that. I'm going to actually try to change the color oh boy, of my, there we go. Now it's green. I'll show it better on this red thing. So if you start building a cabin here, and you build a cabin here, and you build a cabin here, and over here on the lake, that's not going to be a big problem. As long as you have somewhere around 75% of the natural cover, the lake water quality will be okay. You know, some the reason why people like nice, clear, pristine lakes is because the water is clear, and you can swim, and like it doesn't smell bad, right? So um, what's interesting is that like a really clear, pristine lake attracts people to put their cabins on the lake. But the more people that put cabins on the lake and start getting rid of the natural cover, and then once you get, you know, a lake completely ringed in cabins, you lose that natural buffer. And once it's below 60%, once it's pretty much the lake is going to deteriorate all the time. Okay, no matter what you do, this lake here now has so many cabins with so many lawns all around the lake that the water quality is going to de be deteriorate and it's not going to be that pristine lake, clear lake anymore. So what, what we can do is try to balance the needs of human needs versus nature needs. Now, this is a picture of Whitewater Lake right near... Um, you know, in right near Whitewater, right? It's um, this is a clear example, though, of there is no compromise here between human and uh, ecosystem needs. This is all human needs, right? These are people's lawns, you know, right up to the edge of the lake, okay? And this is going to make um, Whitewater Lake not not have very good water quality. Um, this is um, a maybe a better way to think about doing um, human use of lakes. Okay, 
So what this is, is this is my um, uncle's cabin on Cass Lake in northern Minnesota. Now what he did was um, he wanted to keep his natural shoreline as natural as he could. Um, so what um, the, th th this is one of those panoramic shots. And what you see is there's all these rushes, bull rushes here. And, you know, it's not good to swim there. You can't really swim here. But that's fine, he said. He just made a long dock that went out um, past the bull rushes and then was able to have water out here that still wasn't very deep um, that you could swim in very easily. Um, he also built a um, just a very small bo boat house that has a very low footprint. You know, this is maybe only 15 feet wide here, um, and uh, it's up on stilts, so uh, he doesn't really care if water comes up here and, um, you know, goes over his shore, natural shoreline, which is naturally fluctuating anyway. Um, and then he up, you know, he kept this nice forested buffer right here, and up here, he built a cabin. You can't really see it, it's behind the trees here, but it was up on top of the hill with this um, overlooking the water. It was great, really beautiful sight, and it was able to do both things. So he was able to keep the natural buffering of the shoreline, and but still have, you know, all of the access to the water that he wanted. And I think people just need to spend a little bit more time thinking about, okay, how do I keep this natural and pristine and how do I, but then how do I also use it? And I, I think this is a really good compromise between human and natural, natural needs. Okay, now let's switch to eutrophication. Um, what is eutrophication? Eutrophication is when you add a bunch of nutrients to a lake, basically algae grow, lots of stuff grows. It's, you know, not surprising if you add fertilizer, things grow those things being algae. Um, the fertilizer or the nutrients that we're really talking about is phosphorus. Um, phosphorus has the biggest impact on, um, uh, is the most limiting, most common limiting uh, nutrient, but sometimes nitrogen can increase growth too. So where, does, where are these coming from? So point sources can be things like sewage treatment plants and septic tanks, even though most sewage treatment plants are actually putting out water that's cleaner or has fewer um, nutrients than actually the natural system that it's dumping into. But um, there are some sewage treatment plants that don't do a good job um, and septic tanks too. But, um, so those are point sources, but there's really, realistically, most of the eutrophication problems are due to agricultural runoff. So a farmer puts um, fertilizer on a field and a lot of that fertilizer goes in, runs off the land, you know, rain hits that ground and then runs off and drains into rivers that eventually lead to lakes and creates a eutrophic lake. Um, that agriculture is the biggest, um, right now at least, the biggest um, impact for eutrophication. So, you know, what, what's happening is you're increasing this inorganic nutrients that then increases the amount, the, 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 that supply of nutrients to the producers, so the producers get to be a whole lot more. Okay, so you get these green lakes here. Um, what that means then is you have a lot more production in the epilimnion, which then means there's a lot more life going on, which means there's a lot more death going on. So you get a flux of a whole bunch of dead organic material going into the sediments, um, into the hypolimnion, which increases respiration rates, increases decomposition, which eats up the dissolved oxygen and the dissolved oxygen goes down. Increases the amount of sediment production because the more like dead stuff that you have falling down into those sediments, the more silt and gunk you're creating at the bottom of the lake. So how do you prevent nutrients? How, uh, well, how do you prevent eutrophication? Like nobody wants their lake to be this. Everybody wants their lake to be right there, right? Um, so how do you stop this from happening? The first thing you need to do is stop nutrient input. Without stopping nutrient input, nothing else is going to work, okay? Um, this is thinking about 
keeping riparian buffers intact, limiting the point and non-point sources of nutrient uh, runoff, keeping the natural wetlands around a lake that hold um, nutrients in and eat up, eat up a lot of those nutrients before they get into a lake. Basically, leaving the lake shore as much of the lake shore as undeveloped as possible is going to do um, do a lot. So we can think about conservation easements. We can think about individual efforts, like my uncle did with his um, with his lake property. Um, what do you do then if your lake already has um, nutrients in it? Can you extract those nutrients? And the answer is kind of. It's really really expensive. But essentially, these things are needed before you can really do anything. Um, you you got to limit the nutrient input. You've got to leave as much lakeshore undeveloped as possible if you want to get your lake, um, keep your lake clean. So can you reverse it? And the answer is kind of not really. Most lakes when they get to be eutrophic, are eutrophic for 20, 30, 40, 60 years before people start to pay attention and be like, hey, we should get that clear lake again. Remember when it used to be clear? And the problem is, is that as you have this phosphorus input into the lake, you've had these algae blooming in huge numbers for decades. Those algae die, and then you get um, essentially sediments that are extremely high nutrients. Um, so every mixing event, you know, a dimictic lake is mixing twice a year. Those sediments are releasing nutrients back into the water column twice a year. Now this is uh, a little problematic because um, you can't just say, well, let's dredge up those nutrients because the, the, the thing of dredging up those nutrients the act of dredging up those nutrients is that there's going to be a lot of nutrients then resuspended just from that dredging. So eutrophication just isn't really possible. All right, let's fix or change. Sorry, let's change gears and thinking about fish harvest. Okay, um, we use a Ricker curve to kind of model how fish uh, harvest works. Okay. So um, what you have is a, a line uh, of spawners. So this is like basically how many adults and how many recruits that you get. A recruit is a fish that survives to one year. And what we generally see is a if a fish survives one year, it'll eventually probably survive to adulthood. You know, a lot of them still get eaten, but um, that's okay. So what you see is, not surprisingly, the more adults, the more spawners you have, the more recruits you get. So you get this increasing line here, right? Um, but at some point, you get an inflection where um, what happens is if you have too many adults, you get um, too many recruits, which then cause too, basically too many babies too many like before they get to be a, Ukraine, uh, a recruit and you get all the babies like starving, right? There are so many of them, they starve each other out. The adults, adult fish are very cannibalistic. There's very few species that aren't. So you get a lot of cannibalism because there's all these little babies around. Um, also spawners can damage each other's spawning sites. So if you have too many adults uh, like largemouth bass, what they're going to be doing is fighting over spawning sites. And if there's not enough spawning sites, they kind of just mess up the adult males, will mess up each other's spawning sites and um, because they're competing over them so heavily. So, and that re kills a lot of the babies and you get this decrease. Now, what this, the actual shape of that curve is going to be tricky based on, um, it can change based on the species of fish and, and the lake that we're talking about. So we get this maximum recruitment point, right? So at, at some point there's maximum recruitment at the, just the right number of spawners. So we can put a one-to-one -one replacement line here where, you know, this is just, you know, if you have 10 spawners here, you get 10 recruits there, um, you know, but these are obviously much bigger numbers. So anything that is above that, this one-to-one -one replacement line, the population grows. Anything that is below, the population 
declines. Okay, so essentially right here you get, um, you know, this there's, I don't know, 10 million spawning fish in the lake, and then the next year you get 10 million recruits out of that. Population is stable at that point. So the interesting thing is that this is, um, if you want to figure out the maximum sustainable yield, that is the largest catch that can be taken from the stock, from the, the lake over an indefinite period, it's not what you might think of at the maximum recruitment line. So here, let me get out of this um, and show you what I mean here. So basically what's going to happen is, um, well, actually, let me, let, me, let me go back here for a second. If you essentially fish down the spawners to this point, what that means is the next year you'll get this many recruits, okay? Um, and then those recruits, so, so you know, this, this line right here, the length of this line is somewhere like up, up to right around here or something, right? And what we see then is um, if you if you have you know be essentially these recruits turning into a large number of spawners, then it you want to fish to this this maximum sustainable yield because you'll get more recruits. Now let me explain how this works here because if you take let me maybe zoom in on this. If you were to fish, so, so this line here is essentially how much um, how much reproduction there is going to be, and what we see, or I, I should say, how much um, fish you're going to get, and at the maximum recruitment level, you, you, it's it's less actual like yield that you're going to get, less harvest than you're going to get. So you want to go um, a little bit below that um, that maximum recruitment level. The thing is, this is always assuming a constant environment. So we know that you know each year is slightly different. So it's a, um, a little more tricky to say here. What what this this model doesn't always work is kind of what I'm saying. So given this model, fish should basically never go extinct, right? Because even if you have at least some, you know, few numbers of fish down here of adults, they should eventually have more babies the next year, which then would put it up to, you know, this is year two, which then you get this much recruitment in year three, which means your spawners are over here in year three. It's always increasing, right? Because this white line over on the left portion of the graph is always above that one-to-one -one replacement line. It's what we call self-compensating. However, there's an Ali effect, which is the um, individual fitness is dependent on the population of size. Um, and we can see this with um, a, a variety of species of fish that we've fished to too low of levels they go below this Ali threshold. It's a point where population growth is, becomes negative due to these Ali effects. An example is like, so if you zoom in on this portion of the graph, what we oftentimes see is realistically, this, this line doesn't always stay above. It actually dives below um, that. Um, so basically what's happening here is that the spawners aren't able to find each other. There's just they're too far away from each other and they, you know, don't mate because they never find a partner. Um, this has happened with North Atlantic cod. Uh, what we believe is we harvested them below the Ali threshold. So um, this is the number of cod caught um, in, um, in the North Atlantic. And what we see is uh, we saw huge numbers of cod caught in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. There was still large numbers and then the fishery crashed. and it's not going back up, right? There's essentially no North Atlantic cod being caught. When you buy cod in the grocery store or at a restaurant, it's all Pacific cod. And it's not going up because we think we're in this Ali effect. You can still find North Atlantic cod, but they're just um, not mating 
at the rates to be able to actually replace their population. So this overharvest is really a growing problem. We have increased demand, more people are eating fish, and we're just getting better and better gear. This huge fishing trawler, you know, has nets that can be miles long. And overharvest is really um, common in um, in small lakes, right? Like this tiny lake here, they're having a fishing derby here. It's easy to see how this lake might get completely fished out. Even a lake, big lake here, this is, um, I can't remember if it's either Red Lake or Mille Lacs Lake. I think this is Lake Mille Lacs where they're having a fishing tournament. And you can imagine that, you know, there's a lot of fish going to be pulled out of that lake and potentially have a huge uh, impact. So when we think about overharvest, um, it's you know not really that much of a problem right now in the U.S. Um, the the amount of fish in Wisconsin is monitored by the Wisconsin DNR by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and um, we have a really good culture of enforcement and a culture of people following the rules here in the United States. So uh, part of that is there's pretty stiff penalties for um, a lot of wildlife crimes. Um, poaching, you know, deer, you can have uh, up to $10,000 fine. Muskie, you know, they're um, not that much, much fine. But usually when they catch these poachers, they find them with, you know, hundreds of species, uh, hundreds of individuals of those muskies. So um, when they put $43 per fish or something, or a largemouth bass, $26, it becomes, you know, multiple, multiple tens of thousands of dollars fines. Um, so, you know, enforcement in the U.S. isn't really a problem. However, in other countries, it, um, there is a big problem with having um, overharvested fish in certain inland waters. So, the, you know, all the time people ask me, well, how do you get more fish in a lake, right? Like, that's the big thing of, you know, fisher people really want more, more fish. And I understand that, but... Um, you know, the answer that most people want to hear is stocking. Stocking is the answer, right? And what this is doing is often just putting those recruits, you know, if you get a fish up to a recruit, uh, I'm not sure what species is being put in here, but if you get a, uh, a little fish baby up to that recruit level, um, chances are it's going to survive to adulthood. And Wisconsin, Minnesota, a lot of states put in a ton of money every year. Um, the uh, Minnesota has uh, their funding numbers are easier to find. Um, they spend seven point seven million dollars a year on stocking programs around the state. Wisconsin had a I think it's a, there a four or five year walleye initiative. Just walleye itself is stocking walleye. They cost twelve million dollars total, and that's on top of the um, something close to probably that seven point. Seven million years, million per year in um, in Minnesota. Uh, this is a little uh, animation of one of my favorite ways to stock fish, and they're stocking fish in a lake in Alaska here via airplane. And you know, yes, some of those are probably going to die, but um, a decent amount of them will make it. Anyway, stocking though is a problem uh, because I'm going to take that off for a second. Um, when you add those extra recruits, what you're essentially doing is when you go back to that Ricker curve, think about it. When you add those extra recruits, you're actually limiting the natural reproduction. So you have um, um, plenty of extra recruits that can then compete with the natural reproduction. And what we oftentimes see is stocked fish don't actually reproduce in in the habitat where they're they're put in. So um, Stocking is expensive. You always have to maintain it, and um, it's not very long-term successful. So, um, what I always promote is conservation easements. Okay, these are privately owned land where basically the it's put into a trust that the land can never be uh, developed, essentially, and then the owner gets a tax incentive for for that. And the tax benefit is equal to the difference in property value before and after the easement. So if you were to, you know, let the land grow wild, what could it have been worth? And it, it's sometimes a decent amount of money. And 
um, the the thing is, each easement can have different goals. So, you know, like you can have um, a shoreline area and put it into conservation easement, and then it its goal is to increase water quality, make improve water quality in the lake, um, have you know wildlife habitat, or it could even be just keeping it nice so that people can you know as they're going around on, on that lake on their boat they see they don't see a bunch of cabins but it's actually you know forest of what it actually should be. And the thing is, it's extremely cost effective if. Um, you put in $1 into conservation easement, what it gets is $2.80 worth of like money that you would have to put in to do conservation. So it's like a return on your, on your investment of, of you know 280%. That's great, right? So um, think if Minnesota were to put $7.7 .7 million a year, every single year into conservation easements, they would be, gaining a benefit of over $20 million. And that would just stack and stack and stack every year. They would get more and more money rather than pouring money into these stocked fish that aren't going to do anything anyway. The The issue with this is that a lot of people um, dislike it. It's, it's not, I mean, they, they have a problem with people telling them what they should do with their own property. And it also takes a long time. It's a long-term thing where conservation easements, you know, are expected to pay off in the long term. And that's hard for people to see when they want results now, when they want more fish in their lake now. But, um, you know, I think this is really the way where um, conservation needs to be going for fish management. All right, let's switch over to think about invasive species. And I think a really good way to talk about this is um, the Great Lakes, because the Great Lakes are this huge water resource that has a lot of, well, it has some um, endemic species, uh, but we've really got, done a good job of screwing it up. Um, so the um, what we see is that the Welland Canal, which went, that's over here, um, if you look at Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, uh, may, well, maybe we should take a step back here for a second. If you look at the Great Lakes, what you have are um, the four upper Great Lakes, Superior, Michigan, Huron, and Erie, um, were very, uh, their fish fauna were very unique because you have Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is right here, huge, you know, 150 foot waterfall. Nothing from the ocean could basically make it up into Lake Erie, okay? Well, in 1824 then, they made the Welland Canal, which is right here, that went around essentially um, the uh, Lake Ont Niagara Falls and made a water connection between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, okay? So that went up the 234 feet you can see right there. Um, yeah, let me maybe get my laser thing out. Um, so there's this elevation gradient, but there, so there were some locks and you can see the locks right there, 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 and there. But um, what they did then was made a con water connection between Lake Ontario into Lake Erie. A year later, the Erie Canal, which actually connected um, the Hudson River, which comes over, over here in, in New York, and it connected the Hudson River all the way over to Lake Erie. Um, so right there, what happened was a lot of fish came from Lake Ontario and the um, Atlantic Ocean, the diadromous fish that can deal with the salt tolerance uh, differences, and made um, made their way starting in, to get into first Lake Erie, then Huron, and then so forth. Oh, here is a picture of the Erie Canal. So the Hudson River comes up here, and they made a canal all the way over to here to get into Lake Erie. So the ships now, rather than having to go all the way um, through the Welland Canal and all the way up into Canada, they can just make it into here to get to um, you know, other places quicker. So the Great Lakes used to have this native fish uh, fauna of like lake trout, that's right here, um, lake sturgeon, the biggest sturgeon we have in North America, crazy big fish. Um, Lake Herring and Deepwater Ciscos. Essentially what happened then is those were overfished by, you know, like the 1950s. Basically, the 
um, Lake Superior and well, Lake Superior didn't really have very many fish to begin with because it's so cold and oligotrophic. But um, you know, Michigan um, here on the Erie were pretty much fished out by um, the 1950s, and these canals then introduced the sea lampreys into um, the starting in 1824, but they reached Lake Superior by 1946. So these sea lampreys are these parasitic fish that they basically have suction cups and then a bony tongue that they latch on the fish and um, make these big wounds um, uh, and eat the body fluids that are leaked from, from those wounds. And that really hurt the lake po trout population. Lake trout cannot deal with this. These are an inland fish, um, whereas the sea lampreys themselves are used to dealing with oceanic fish. So, um, you know, they, they really had problems. Um, and essentially, lake trout, lake sturgeon populations crashed because of these sea lampreys. Well, the rainbow smelt and alewives then, it, Aided, uh, invaded at this same time in, um, in the early 1900s. But once you get all those big predators gone, so the lake trout are gone, um, and there's essentially no more predators in the Great Lakes. So these fish populations exploded. My dad used to live in Milwaukee. He grew up in Milwaukee. He was born in Milwaukee, lived through into the 70s and he would say there were times when he would go down in like the late 50s and 60s down to the lakeshore in Milwaukee and there would just be bulldozers bulldozing these alewives. These alewives are these um, Atlantic fish that are on the the cusp of what they can survive actually in Lake Michigan. Uh, so it just takes a slight temperature change and you get huge mass die-offs. Um, and so that there was this huge problem where they would just be taking all these fish and like burying them. And it was really gross in Lake Michigan. Um, so, so, you know, 1950s, early 60s, we have a ton of rainbow smelt and alewives. These are the rainbow smelt, sorry. Um, so they thought, hey, let's introduce salmon, right? The salmon know how to deal with um uh, the, the lampreys. So let's put in salmon. Uh, they put like Chinook and coho salmon, I believe, into Lake Michigan. And um, essentially what they have is unlimited food, right? These fish have huge amounts of food for them. They were growing super fast and really a lot of people are like, great, now we have salmon in Lake Michigan. And they were able to um, you know, use that resource. And um, that that's okay, I guess. Uh, this fish here, this salmon is actually only two years old. Um, and that's how fast that they were growing in Lake Michigan. This is this is a picture taken from Lake Michigan in like, I think 1968. Um, so great that we have salmon and that there's like a, now an active fishery, but they're, they're all invasive species. Um, the, the next big thing then is in the late 1980s, the zebra mussels come in and later in the 90s, the quagga mussels come in. And um, there's some good and bad for these. Um, basically what we have now is that most of the biomass of organisms in Lake Michigan are quagga mussels. Um, they're just completely, the entire bottom of Lake Michigan is covered over with quagga mussels. And uh, the good thing about that is they've actually made now Lake Michigan the clearest lake, uh, the clearest Great Lake, at least. Um, and what they're doing is they're transporting all that algae biomass to the sediments. And, and what they're doing is they're locking up a lot of um, nutrients that were what was in the water and putting it into their shells and their shells like basically decompose very slowly. Um, and um, a lot of that phosphorus is coming out of Lake Michigan. So Lake Michigan isn't having as much um, uh, eutrophication problems, but we're still just covered in mussels and most of the biomass. They're stealing a lot of that energy that should be available for the fish that are in the, the mussels now. Same thing happened in Lake Erie. Lake Erie is not as eutrophic as it's relatively clear right now because of those zebra mussel. Um, a lot of people sometimes ask me, well, like, we always talk about invasive species coming here. What have we transported to other places? 
And one of the main things is mosquito fish. Um, I think it's um, interesting that they're named mosquito fish because they don't really actually eat mosquitoes that much, but a lot of people use them for mosquito control, even though they're not that great at it. So the native range of the mosquito fish is uh, basically the Mississippi watershed. And what we see is it's now all over the US and pretty much all over the world, all the yellow, yellow spots. Um, there's this cool place in Sochi, Russia that has a, um, a statue that is um, praising the mosquito fish for helping them get rid of malaria. Whether the mosquito fish or other methods actually got rid of malaria in that part of Russia uh, is up for debate, but they at least have this statue. Um, this is the rainbow trout, um, and we can see that it's native to the western coast of uh, the U.S. and the Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia, but it's now, because it's such a tasty fish and something that's so fun to catch, it's all over the world now. And I, I mean, I'm sure it's in Guyana and Suriname over here, but um, I, I, I'm not sure why it wouldn't be, but they both probably aren't uh, monitoring for it. Uh, largemouth bass, because it's a great sport fish and people love to catch them, um, we've got that pretty much all over the world. It um, used, it's only found, native ranges in the Mississippi River Basin, but now it's found all over the US, Europe, um, Japan, Philippines, New Zealand, South Africa, and a lot of people like to fish for that. So there's um, a couple examples of, you know, invasive species that we have been able to export. You know, not like it's a good thing, but at least you can have pride that we um, have exported some of our invasive species. All right, with that, see you later.